First, it was Australia. An outbreak at a Melbourne high school has become the state's largest COVID-19 cluster. Then Japan. There is a lot of concern. Will Tokyo go back into a state of emergency? Hong Kong. Infectious diseases experts warn that the triple-figure surge will likely continue in the next few days. And Vietnam. Vietnam went back on high alert on Saturday following its first community infection in nearly three months. Weeks ago, these countries were declared free of COVID-19. People flocked to parks and beaches. Restaurant dining was allowed and life pretty much returned to normal. But then there was another spike in cases with the dreaded second wave. It feels like we'll never get out of this COVID-19 spiral. Since July, Singapore has been able to keep community transmission cases low at single digits. But if what's happening in other countries is anything to go by, a second wave feels inevitable. If and when it hits us in Singapore, I want to know how prepared are we? I'm starting my investigation with someone who's been keeping a close watch on Singapore's healthcare sector. When the first cases emerged here in Singapore, I was very closely working with the government to try to ameliorate this very difficult situation. When COVID-19 hit, Jeremy Lim was involved in modelling out potential pandemic responses. If you have to contact trace 50 people, mm. that's far more manageable. He is convinced that a second wave is coming. We are a very porous country. Our economy depends on this porosity, on, on travellers coming in to do business, to do trade. So inevitably, we will see cases that come in because of the biology and because of the nature of the imperfection or the uncertainty around testing. We just need one case to slip through this very tight net that the Singapore government has wrapped around Singapore and we will see this second wave. So what if a few cases get into the country? Well, the challenge is that COVID-19 is an exponential disease. And what this then means is that one case becomes two, two become four, eight, 16, 32, and before you know it, it's completely out of control. Does this mean that a second wave is likely to be triggered by imported cases? No. If we have community cases that are well under control, then the only other source would be imported cases. Can you tell me when the second wave will happen? When the second wave happens, it is most likely to occur during the Northern Hemisphere winter months, that would be December, January, February. And this is because, assuming Singapore starts to reopen, the airport is active, we have travellers coming in from all over the world, they may bring the imports. Health experts expect colder conditions in winter to lead to an uptick in cases. That's because in winter, people tend to stay indoors clustered together. Less ventilation and less outdoor time are all bad news. We don't have winter in Singapore, but there is a chance we will see the second wave come in the form of imported cases from cold countries. The other worrying thing, the virus appears to have mutated. The mutated strain is called D614G, and scientists think it could be far more infectious, and its presence has been increasing in Asia. While we don't know if this mutation is found in the second wave of most countries, from what we've seen so far, the second wave is higher or as high as the first. In Australia, the first wave saw its highest peak of over 6,000 cases in April. But the second outbreak in Melbourne brought the total number of cases to over 20,000 cases in two months. Closer to home, Hong Kong's total cases were over 1,000 in its first peak. But by August, cases surged nearly four times that. We're looking at a second wave that could potentially be more virulent than the first. I want to know what kind of preparations we're taking. So I'll be heading to the nerve centre of one of our largest public hospitals. We are able to pick up unusual activities if there is a spike in the number of patients.
Across the globe, we are seeing second waves of coronavirus infections. I want to know how prepared Singapore is if we encounter a surge in cases again. When COVID-19 cases start to grow, health systems have to move quickly. Sometimes in a matter of days, to allocate resources and implement new workflows. Tan Tok Singh Hospital is the epicentre of Singapore's infectious disease management. This is Tan Tok Singh's command centre. Here, a team of 20 staff monitor every aspect of the hospital, from bed occupancy to the number of patients being screened for COVID-19. It can even forecast the likely number of COVID-19 patients discharged. When Singapore's first wave of infections hit, within 24 hours, the system allowed the team to pool together manpower and equipment to open five wards at the National Centre for Infectious Diseases. Today, the hospital's chief operating officer is showing me how lessons from the first wave is preparing them for the second. This is essentially the brain of the entire campus operations. It gives management uh, and oversight of the activities at different components in, in the campus. So just to give you an example, uh, some of the screens over here would show the number of patients who are currently at our screening centre at the National Centre for Infectious Diseases. Another aspect of the screen would show you the occupancy, the number of beds that are occupied by patients, and the number of empty beds that we have in order to be ready for the next admission. Uh, on the further end, you would see uh, CCTV screens as well, and that essentially shows the activities that are going on uh, at the different parts of the hospital. So from your experience in dealing with the outbreak during the earlier stages, what is the one most important thing that you had to change? More so in an outbreak, to, to ensure that, for example, we have sufficient protective equipments, both for patients and also for our staff. We also have to put in um, information, for example, um, the imaging turnaround time, so the x-rays, uh, the lab turnaround time, so these were the COVID tests that our labs were doing. We need to monitor how quickly the results are coming back because only when we know the results, we are able to allocate the correct disposition for the patients. What benefit or what advantages does this give you in managing a pandemic? It helps to link the dots because patients flow from one setting to another setting and we need to be able to monitor the patient's movement as they transit from, say, the screening centre to the inpatient wards and finally discharge back uh, to the community. And because of that, we are able to pick up uh, unusual activities. If, for example, there is a spike in the number of patients who are coming to the National Centre for screening. So this screen here shows the bed occupancy rate at the different facilities. So we monitor these numbers view time, but if the numbers creep up, actually we do have backup plans in place. There are contingency plans in place. We do have standby facilities, standby beds, uh, fully equipped with the consumables and with the equipments as well. So within 24 to 48 hours, we are able to ramp up. Are you prepared for the next wave? In short, I would say that we are ready. We do have the ability to manage the resources. We do have the ability to look at what's happening on the ground real time. But there is still something that concerns me. Remember, hospitals have other cases to manage besides COVID-19. If I'm a patient, should I resume my care plan before a second wave hits? For some answers, I'm speaking to the hospital's medical board chairman. If I have an elective surgery right. planned, for example, mm. and um, this period we seem to be seeing fewer infections, mm. I might be tempted to say, I'll better get the surgery in right. now right. before things get any worse. Yes. Is this the right attitude? So there is that uh, temptation and there is, we, we feel that pent up demand as well. Patients calling up, when's my surgery? But uh, we have taken the direction from ministry to take a more centralised approach, forming a hospital services prioritisation committee where we get the doctors to prioritise many of the needs of these patients either through coming to hospital for an investigation, doing a test maybe at the GP's clinic. It requires quite a bit of communication to reassure the patients but many of them understand 
and I think that uh, that helps us to uh, not overwhelm ourselves and, and reserve some of these uh, capacity in case a second wave arrives. That has created a backlog of elective surgeries. Have you been able to clear that backlog already? It will take some time to clear that, but the principle is to ensure that patients are triaged according to their needs and that those who require timely treatment are not deprived. We also collaborate with other hospitals to take on some of these urgent loads in the event that we are overwhelmed by the demands. Simply put, if your case is not a medical emergency, no need to rush to get an appointment. Because hospitals will continue to reduce non-urgent clinical work so that ICU beds can be reserved for those who truly need them, especially those with COVID-19. I think that's a real concern because in many countries where the fatality rates are high, this is generally when the pandemic is so large and, and the number of ill patients overwhelm the ICU. So I think uh, we've, we've learned our lesson from the other countries and, and we were fortunate to have a very low fatality, but we are prepared. We have been uh, building up our stocks, uh, ensuring that enough capacity uh, in terms of ICU facilities. We have also been um, conducting training to broaden the pool of staff that are ICU capable. Our hospitals seem on top of things, but the virus is not going away anytime soon. We've got started on the vaccine, but I wonder how far along are we with it? The good news, clinical human trials are underway in Singapore. I get an exclusive look into the process to find out how this trial can help to mitigate a second wave of COVID-19. There is always risk to participating in a trial. Don't you worry about the risks? Experts expect a second wave of COVID-19 infections to hit us before the cooler months at the end of the year. The virus can survive longer in colder conditions and is more likely to spread when people spend time indoors. In the meantime, more than 100 vaccines are being developed globally. And as we speak, our medical school, Duke NUS, has started human trials on a vaccine from a US firm. The vaccine has already shown promising responses in mice. I've got a rare opportunity to speak to a volunteer of the trial, but due to ethical reasons, he is promised anonymity. Why did you decide to volunteer for the trial? Joining uh, clinical research to give information to the doctors so that um, treatment can be given to those who need it more and it can be diagnosed more quickly. What about the risks? I mean, there, there, there is always risks to participating in the trial. Um, I would think even if you were to mop the floor at home, there is risk. If you drive the car, there is risk also. It is just that uh, in clinical trials, the risk is accentuated because in the research, they have to tell you all that there is, that is possible could happen which makes people a bit uh, afraid of clinical trials in general. But uh, frankly speaking, I feel that there is nothing at all to be afraid of. Some people may worry that the speed at which some of these trials are taking place, there may be questions or doubts about their safety. What is your response to that? I will feel that uh, for every vaccine to be uh, released to the masses, there will need to be uh, extensive uh, research and study. And it's going to be, take time. So uh, more clinical research participants will be able to facilitate and expedite the time taken to release this vaccine. For a deeper insight into what happens during the trial, I am given exclusive access into SingHealth's Investigational Medicine Unit, where the trials are conducted. This is Dr. Shireen. She's one of the investigators of the clinical trials. And today, she's going to take me through the various stages of the vaccine trial process. We're here. Um, so now what happens is I'm going to brief um, our volunteers uh, to explain to them about the clinical trial uh, and what they can expect during the course of the trial. Uh, and then after that, I will be speaking to them one-on-one -on -one, uh, for the informed consent. Why do you need to talk to them one-on-one? -on -one? 
So the, the reason why we see them one-on-one -on -one is so that we can clarify any questions that they have or any concerns that they have. So after the informed consent process, uh, I'm not going to take you through the screening uh, process. This is where our volunteers undergo tests like uh, ECGs, uh, vital signs and blood tests to make sure that they are fit and uh, meet the criteria for the clinical trial. And uh, why do you need them to be fit? This is an investigational vaccine. It's, it's the first time it's being given in humans. So we need to make sure that the volunteers are healthy or, and whatever medical conditions they may have, it's well controlled. And so this allows us then to study and better understand the safety of the vaccine. So after the volunteer goes through the screening and passes all the screening tests, um, they will come back on a separate day uh, for the vaccination. So that's when they get the injection. Which stage of the trial are you at now? So we're currently in the first phase of the trial. Clinical trials for vaccines typically involve three phases. Phase one involves a small number of volunteers, usually a hundred. Phase 2 is similar, but the number of volunteers increases to several hundreds. The final phase looks into finding out if the vaccine is effective. To expedite the development, researchers in Singapore have combined both Phase 1 and 2 to run concurrently. The Singapore trial is expected to be completed by end of October. But what will happen if a second wave hits us before that? Professor Wee Ing Yong and his team are in charge of analysing the results of the vaccine trials. And as I'm about to discover, it is a long and onerous process before we hit that sweet spot. So phase one is to ask the question, how high a dose can we go before the side effects become a bit intolerable, right? So ideally, you want to give as much vaccine as you can so that then the immune system has a chance of making a good and strong response that will protect the people against the SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19. But at the same time, when you increase the dose, then side effects start to become more common. So we're just trying to find that sweet spot so that we get the best response possible without all the unnecessary side effects. Have you found the sweet spot? It's in progress. So we are into our first two doses now. Possibly, you know, by end of this month, we'll be hopefully dosed everyone with uh, all four doses that we think will be within that range. Then we need to observe over several months just to see that, one, what kind of side effects they develop, and two, that the immune response is uh, robust. On top of that, we're going to ask whether, what if we give a second dose, would that be useful? I think that this could has a chance of being a one-dose vaccine, and that would be great the unprecedented pace at which this vaccine is being developed is also raising a different area of concerns. Mm -hmm. And that is what normally takes, say, two to three years or even more, you're compressing it within a very short mm -hmm. time frame. Mm -hmm. Is that cause for worry? Today, we have far better ways of assessing safety in humans than to go through the kind of animal studies that we have done in the past. So, in, unfortunately, nobody's come back to look at this 10, 15 year timeline and say, you know, which, what, which part of what we're, what's involved in there are really necessary and which parts are really completely non-informative and then re systematically remove those that are not needed. That hasn't happened. So in some ways, this, this pandemic may be spurring that process. Just like in other areas of our life, this may cause a, or trigger a reset exactly. in the way that your community works. Absolutely. And now the million dollar question. How is having a vaccine going to help us if a second or a subsequent wave comes along? So, to, to be technically absolutely correct, there, there's no way we can promise that the vaccine, uh, if given before the second wave in Singapore, will stop the second wave. But there, there is a, a major advantage being involved in clinical trial. If, for instance, if we, we are able to start phase three trial before the second wave, arrives in Singapore, if it does, we have a very quick chance of seeing a very early readout of what happens to the, those who receive the vaccine. So indeed, if the next wave hits during our phase 3 trial, then we might be able to get a faster answer as to whether the vaccine works. And then the sooner we get it, the sooner we can get the vaccine available to everyone. Well, I couldn't think of any silver lining in the next spike of infections. That's one! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
vaccine being tested in Singapore is called the Lunar Cove 19 vaccine. It is one of 25 vaccines around the world currently being tested on humans. Having human trials done in Singapore guarantees us to be one of the first few countries to get our hands on a COVID-19 vaccine once it's ready to be released. So Singapore is prepared for the second wave, but vaccine trials and hospital contingency plans are only the tip of the iceberg. As we've seen in other countries, complacency was the real silent killer. So as inconvenient as it seems now to stick to safe distancing and this, wear masks, it is precisely this discipline that could decide how big of a problem our next wave could be.